want to just say uh, thank you once again. Um, band wasn't just something that kept me out of trouble. It, it resulted in the best friends of my lifetime. To this day, I keep in contact with people I was in band with, and uh, I have to say how much I appreciated that. I know, generally speaking, it says that we have a reading of Scripture right before we go into our message today, but we're going to do it a little bit differently in that Sophia is going to be actually helping me throughout the sermon with the reading of Scripture. So our Scripture reading is really going to be part of the message today, so she'll come up and join me here in just a moment. In 1886... It was October 28 when the Statue of Liberty was unveiled. It stands 151 feet and one inch, I'm not sure how they got the extra inch, above New York Harbor. In the left hand of the Statue of Liberty, we see the Declaration of Independence represented there. In the right hand is the torch that is lighting the way. It took nine years to complete the Statue of Liberty. It cost in that day $530,000 to build it between the pedestal and the statue itself. In today's currency, that would be over $10 million. It was shipped in 214 packing crates, weighed 450,000 pounds when it came over to the United States by boat from France. It represents hope for refugees, for immigrants, and a reminder to those yearning to be free that freedom can't happen. The poem there at its base says, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Now those are beautiful words. May I say, however, that it takes more than beautiful words for freedom to happen. I want to invite you, as we are beginning today, to turn to John chapter 19, verse 28 through 30. We'll start there with our scripture this morning. That's not what Sophia needs to worry about reading right now. But I want to read that to you because it sets the stage. Once again, we're in this series, It Is Finished. Today we're talking about another thing that is proclaimed finished. We set the sage stage there, it says in John chapter 19, verse 28 through 30. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put a hyssop branch and put on it a hyssop branch and held it to his lips. And when Jesus bowed, had tasted it, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and released his spirit. What is it that was finished is what we're going to look at today, the last thing that was finished. And to do this, I want to set up the context for what we're going to read because we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 8, verse 1 through 11, and really studying through this scripture to discover what it is that was finished. The stage is set when we take a look at the history of this particular text. Paul is speaking to Roman Christians, and these Roman Christians are made up of both Jews and Gentiles that have been converted to the way of Jesus. In 49 AD, the emperor by the name of Claudius expelled all the Jews from Rome. So if you have a church made up of Roman Christians and Jewish Christians and they expelled the Jews, who's left over to look care for the church? The Gentiles, the Roman Gentiles. They're in charge of this church now because they're all that's left. And so... According to the quote, actually, it says that uh, Claudius says that they caused continuous, the Jews did, caused continuous disturbances at the instigation of Crestus. Crestus was the Roman spelling for Christ. 
And these Jews fled to every part of the empire at that time, and probably several of them would have met Paul in other parts of the empire originally. Years later, these Jews would return. And you've got a problem now because you have the Gentiles who have been in charge for quite some time, and then the Jews who it was their church when they left, now they're in the same room and they've got to figure all of this out. They didn't always see eye to eye. Over and over again throughout Romans, Paul refers to the word all. He speaks of the importance of unity. He says over and over again things like, the gospel is for all people. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And this whole theme goes throughout the book of Romans. He speaks of all people's struggles within the church in Romans chapter 7. He represents it in himself, and he represents this internal conflict that he has over and over again between the sinful nature and life in the Spirit. His desperate cry found in Romans chapter 7 verse 25, or 24 and 25. It says there in Romans 7, 24 and 25, Oh, what a miserable person I am! Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so we come to Romans chapter 8, and we'll start with verse 1 through 4. Therefore, this is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free, free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son into the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Thank you so much, Sophia. Excellent reading. So when we read through this particular passage, we need to understand something. There is a role here that a judge plays. And really, this is very much spoken in the legalese of the day. There's a role of a judge. In our time today, we think of a judge a little bit differently than they did in Paul's day. We think of a judge as somebody who's dispassionate, who's disconnected from what's being talked about. He has to, without bias, judge between right and wrong, between guilt and innocence. It was a little bit different in the first century. Because the understanding of a judge legally in the first century was that a judge was one that actively was working on behalf of the accused or those oppressed by someone. They were working to vindicate that person. And when we understand that, it changes the meaning of all of this because if that's the role that, that Paul would have had in mind when he wrote this, then we have to understand the role of God himself changes, doesn't it? In our minds, he's not just dispassionately saying between, or unbiasedly saying between right and wrong. He's working on behalf of those oppressed and accused to vindicate those who have been oppressed by sin. He's working for you. He's not, if he was just saying, if I had to weigh the evidence between right and wrong, I mean, we'd be in trouble. But that's not what he's doing. He is working on behalf of those who have been impressed by sin. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says there, God made Christ. This is the work of God right here. This is the work of the judge working to vindicate those oppressed. God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. The work of God on our behalf is the gospel. It is his work on our behalf to save all that would come to him. Amen. I want to just demonstrate this just for a moment. 
the work of God on our behalf. What, is, what do I have here? Very good. We all know what this is now. So I need, a, I need a couple of people to help me out, though. Maybe, Sophia, you're, you're a brave girl, so I'm going to have you come up. Um, I'm, I need one other person, though. Thomas, would you mind helping me out for a second? I was trying to tell Thomas when he was standing up here to stay towards the front, and I failed miserably. So it's my fault that you had to come all the way up here. If you guys could come and join me here under the umbrella. <clears throat> so here's the deal. The umbrella represents the law of God, okay? When we're under the umbrella of the law of God, anything that is coming down towards us, anything that is attacking us, sin, basically, if we can imagine it being the rain that, it, that the umbrella is protecting us from. So when we're under that umbrella, we're protected, aren't we? Okay, well, here's the problem. What did humanity decide to do? They step, you stay here. I'm going to have Sophia, you're going to have to represent people, okay? Can you just step out for just a second? That's not good, is it? Because when humanity step, by the way, your role is Jesus. Don't let it get to your head, okay? <laughs> when humanity steps out from underneath that umbrella, we're in trouble because Sophia here, representing humans, is now exposed and anything can get her. Well, here's the other problem. Humanity keeps trying to get back under the umbrella. Go ahead and try. Nope. Go ahead and try. No. Nope. It doesn't work that way because no matter how hard we try, we can try to get under the umbrella, and you might even get under it for a little while, but we keep stepping back out. And that's what our human nature does. That's what Paul's talking about when he's struggling between his love for the law and being under the umbrella and that human nature that keeps dragging him back out. So what does God do as the, ju as the judge? He's working on behalf of the oppressed, right? To vindicate. So what does he do? So let's imagine Thomas is Jesus, not letting it get to his head. He's going to step out. Now, he hasn't done anything wrong, but he stepped out, and Jesus died on the cross. And because he fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law, according to Romans, it put us back under the umbrella again. And it is a protecting us once again. If you guys can have a seat. Thank you. Give them a hand. That was great. All they had to do was walk back and forth, and they were for pros at it. That's the beautiful thing about the work of God in vindicating us. In Christ, we are safe. If we struggle with our human nature, we're still safe. Your struggle does not remove your protection in Christ. So what is it that is finished? What is finished? Condemnation is finished. Sin in the sinful flesh is finished. Law, the law is satisfied. The right way to understand finished in the Bible actually is to also think of it as being fulfilled or satisfied. So it is finished. Condemnation is finished for us. Are you truly alive, though? What else is finished? I want to illustrate that with a story of Frederick Douglass. He grew up a slave in Maryland. He was taken from his mother when he was just an infant and suffered all the abuses of slavery that you can think of. For years, he only ate cornmeal dumped in a trough that he fought over with other kids, scooping it up and eating it with oyster shells. He worked in the hot fields from sun up to sundown. He was whipped with cowhide strips till he bled, and he was kicked and beaten frequently. Now, Frederick Douglass escaped slavery. We know about that. But he wrote some things in his book. He wrote about two fears that he had in escaping from slavery. 
First of all, he was afraid of leaving behind his friends that were still in slavery. The draw of his very close, dear friends still being there caused him to pause just a little bit. You know what else also was haunting him, the second fear? It was the fear of failure. Because if he failed, he knew that he would be forever marked as a slave. Our slavery today is really, even though it may not be as graphic and as historically talked about, our slavery to sin is far worse, isn't it? It is far worse, and it's impossible to escape by our own efforts. I am thankful today, hallelujah, we don't have to because we have a deliverer. Romans chapter 8, 5 through 8 is the next text that we're going to read, Sophia. And it contrasts something. Let's have Sophia read that right now. Verse 5 through 8. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Thank you. There is a stark contrast in this text, isn't there? There's a contrast of lives. There is that life lived in the flesh and the life lived in the spirit. There is that sinful nature versus the spiritual nature. The sinful nature, really, when we look at it, it's domination. It's mastery over you in a way you don't want it. The spiritual nature, on the other hand, is not so much domination. It's guidance. It's the Holy Spirit teaching us what we should do. The sinful nature is hopelessness. The the sinful nature is hopelessness. The spiritual nature is life and peace. The sinful nature is self-dependence. We keep trying to either get back under the umbrella or we're trying to escape slavery and we keep failing, failing, but the spiritual nature is reliance on the one who delivers every day. The sinful nature is that enmity with God where the spiritual nature is the nature of a reborn child. To be led by the Spirit, by the way, is to be subject to the Spirit. It's to conduct your life after Jesus. By the way, subject, that's an interesting word. To subject oneself is something that we do voluntarily. It's not forced. But it's saying basically, Holy Spirit, I want you, I want to be under your control. And the paradox of all of this is that there is freedom in that kind of subjection. When we say we are controlled by the Spirit, that is something that brings us freedom. And the beautiful thing about this is it's not forced. This is not something that we're made to do. It's a choice that we are given. That choice is a daily one. It's a choice to say, I place myself under the control of the Holy Spirit. It's a daily commitment that says, I will conduct my life after the life of Christ because I love Him. Not because I'm trying to get back under the umbrella, but because I love what He's done for me. It's a daily conviction that says, I am free. I don't have to live but controlled by what I hate. I am free in Jesus. It is finished. Condemnation is finished. Slavery is finished. Question is, are you truly alive? Romans chapter 8, verse 9 through 11 will come in just a moment. Today, by the way, would be the 285th birthday of Daniel Boone. You know who Daniel Boone was? Famous pioneer. Today is his 285th birthday. 
If he were here today, he would only be known for old age. He grew up and he built a settlement called Boonesboro, Kentucky. Very clever. In 1778, he was taken captive by the Shawnee tribe. In fact, when he was taken captive, they were so impressed with his wilderness skills that they decided they needed to make him a Shawnee. So here's what they did. They plucked out his hair, except for one little lock on the top. It's called a scalp lock. Okay? So they plucked out his hair. They ceremonially washed his blood to get the white blood out of him, and they used the juice of certain plants to stain his skin so he would look more like they did. And they called him the son of Blackfish, the chief. He hunted with their braves. He pretended to really enjoy this life, but the day came when the Shawnees were going to attack Boonesboro. He escaped. He ran back to his settlement and prepared his men there to protect the settlement. And the raid failed. You know, you may be surrounded by people of a differing family sometimes. You may be surrounded all the time by people who have not come to know Jesus, who are not part of the family of God, but that does not mean that you aren't part of the greatest family. You can be wherever you want to be, and you can still remember that you're a child of God. And no matter where you are, that does not take you away from his protection. If we could just have Sophia come up and finish up here, Romans 8, verse 9 through 11. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because his Spirit who lives in you. Thank you. kind of love how this is going because we read the scripture and then study the scripture. Instead of, you know, trying to remember, we can go through it together like this. And I really appreciate your flexibility this morning in doing it that way, Sophia. There is a great importance to words. When we read through this text, there are words that are critical to understand. When we talk about the spirit... In the New Testament, the word is pneuma. It is that life-giving and animating wind or breath of God, as they would have understood that. When we say that the Spirit dwells in us, it literally does mean to make one's home in. So when we talk about the house of God, by the way, and this is a little bit of an aside, We've got to stop thinking that just means where we come into a building of brick and mortar to worship. You, if you are in Christ, you are the house of God. And the Spirit lives and dwells in you. This is a gathering of houses of God, really. We need to also understand there's another word there in the King James Version. It says to quicken. And that means it means to produce alive, to beget living young. That is literally what we're talking about when we say we are born again. John chapter 1 talks about people who are born not of the flesh, but born of the Spirit. They become children of God. This actually is talked about again in verse 17 of Romans chapter 8. It says there, And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. We inherit from God all the glories of heaven because we're in Jesus. Because he has actually reborn us as members of his family. This really is death to life. What becomes dead is the sinful nature. It is finished. What becomes alive is the righteousness of Jesus in us through faith. That means we actually believe that Christ has made us righteous. 
We don't look at our external behaviors. We're not looking at the sinful nature. We're looking at Jesus because that's what the Father does anyway. He looks at Jesus. Why don't we? And what the Spirit brings us is life. It brings us righteousness of Jesus. It brings us belonging. As a result, I belong to the family of God. This is life in me because of this. I don't have to feel like death is imminent. I don't have to fear death anymore. I don't have to fear my imperfections. I don't have to fear my failures. I don't have to fear freedom even. It's a strange thing that sometimes prisoners actually fear their freedom. But I don't have to fear what that's going to be like because sin and condemnation and slavery and death, it's all finished. I don't have to fear being healed. I don't have to fear messing it up because I'm in Christ. And all that I need to look at is the righteousness of Jesus because that's what God's looking at. What is finished? Sin is finished. Condemnation is finished. Slavery is finished. Death is finished. Question is, are you truly alive? How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as frustrated? Then I got news for you. The word says that you can be alive. If you feel enslaved, you can be alive. If you feel like a failure, you can be alive. If you feel fearful, you can be alive. If you're beating yourself up over everything you seem to keep doing wrong, you can be alive. If you feel wounded, you can be alive. The question is, is will you choose today to be alive? I want to just ask you to bow your heads for just a moment. Close your eyes. We're going to pray together, but I'm asking you to make a choice today. This is an invitation today to you. If you choose to be under the control of the Holy Spirit, if you commit to pattern your life after Jesus, and if you are convicted today, I am free. Condemnation is finished in me. Slavery is finished in me. Death is finished in me. And I believe I am alive. If that is you, just put your hand high in the air. Father in heaven, you see these raised hands. You see our, your people here in Christ. And I just pray right now that we would believe this and that we would believe that we are free, that we are alive. It is finished because you have finished it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.